Whereas by Lele Long Soldier. Lele Long Soldier's Whereas repurposes congressional doublespeak in order to lay bare the murderous hypocrisy lurking behind the official language of the state. Deftly deploying a variety of techniques and idioms, Long Soldier has crafted an intricate and urgent counter history, a work of elegy, outrage, and profound generosity that explores what possibilities of interconnection in the present might be enabled by a genuine reckoning with the past. I am a citizen of the United States and an enrolled member of the Aglala Sioux Tribe. Long Soldier writes in the introduction to the title poem, meaning I am a citizen of the Aglala Lakota Nation, and in this dual citizenship I must work, I must eat, I must art, I must mother, I must friend, I must listen, I must observe, constantly I must live. Just to preface, it is on. Uh, it is titled "38" because it is about uh, 38 um, Dakota men who were hanged. Keep in mind, I am not a historian, so I will recount facts as best as I can, given limited resources and understanding. Before Minnesota was a state, the Minnesota region, generally speaking, was the traditional homeland for Dakota, Anishinaabeg, and Ho-Chunk people. During the 1800s, when the US expanded territory, they, quote, purchased land from the Dakota people as well as other tribes. But another way to understand that sort of purchase is Dakota leaders ceded land to the US government in exchange for money or goods, but most importantly, the safety of their people. Some say that Dakota leaders did not understand the terms they were entering or they never would have agreed. Even others call the entire negotiation trickery. But to make whatever it was, official and binding, the U.S. government drew up an initial treaty. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> excuse me. This treaty was later replaced by another, more convenient treaty, and then another. I've had difficulty unraveling the terms of these treaties given the legal speak and congressional language. I don't know if any of you have tried to read treaties. It is not an easy task. <laughs> it's not easy to follow. As treaties were abrogated or broken and new treaties were drafted one after another, the new treaties were Often, often referenced old defunct treaties, and it's a muddy switchback trail to follow. Although I often feel lost on this trail, I know I am not alone. However, as best as I can put it, excuse me, as best as I can put the facts together, in 1851, Dakota Territory was contained to a 12-mile by 150-mile long strip along the Minnesota River. But just seven years later, 
1858, the northern portion was ceded or taken, and the southern portion was conveniently allotted, which reduced Dakota land to a stark 10-mile tract. These amended and broken treaties are often referred to as the Minnesota treaties. The word Minnesota comes from mani, which means water. A lot of you guys have heard that term in the last couple of years, mani. And sota, which means turbid. Synonyms for turbid include muddy, unclear, cloudy, confused, and smoky. Everything is in the language we use. For example, a treaty is essentially a contract between two sovereign nations. The U.S. treaties with the Dakota Nation were legal contracts that promised money. It could be said the money was payment for the land the Dakota ceded, for living within assigned boundaries or a reservation and for relinquishing rights to their vast hunting territory, which in turn made Dakota people dependent on other means to survive. Money. The previous statement is circular, akin to so many aspects of history. As you may have guessed by now, the money promised to the turbid, excuse me, the money promised in the turbid treaties did not make it into the hands of Dakota people. In addition, local government traders would not offer credit to, quote, Indians to purchase food or goods. Without money or credit or rights to hunt beyond the 10 mile tract of land, Dakota people began to starve. The Dakota people were starving. The Dakota people starved. In the preceding sentence, the word starved does not need italics for emphasis. One should read, the Dakota people starved as a straightforward and plainly stated Fact. As a result, and without, without other options but to continue to starve, Dakota people retaliated. Dakota warriors organized, struck out, and killed settlers and traders. This revolt is called the Sioux Uprising. Eventually, the U.S. Cavalry came to Minnesota to confront the uprising. More than 1,000 Dakota people were sent to prison. As already mentioned, 
38 Dakota men were subsequently hanged. After the hanging, those 1,000 Dakota prisoners were released. However, as further consequence, what remained of Dakota territory in Minnesota was dissolved or stolen. The Dakota people had no land to return to. This means they were exiled. Homeless, the D Dakota people of Minnesota were relocated or forced onto reservations in South Dakota and Nebraska. Now, every year a group called the third Dakota 38 plus two riders conduct a memorial horse ride from Lower Brule, South Dakota to Mankato, Minnesota. Have you guys heard of that? Go on YouTube, you'll be blown away. <laughs> they have videos, it's, very, it's really beautiful. So they do a memorial horse ride in um, really cold temperatures, but it's really also um, very healing for the community. Um, uh, and it's really, uh, for me, just um, a beautiful thing to, to see that dedication. In any case, they conclude their journey on December 26th, the day of the hanging. Memorials help focus our memory on particular people or events. Often memorials come in the forms of plaques, statues, or gravestones. The memorial for the Dakota 38 is not an object inscribed with words, but an act. Yet, I started this piece because I was interested in writing about grasses. So there is one other event to include, although it's not in chronological order, and we must backtrack a little. When the Dakota people were starving, as you may remember, government traders would not extend store credit to Indians. Remember I said that? Yeah. Okay. One trader named Andrew Myrick is famous for his refusal to provide credit to Dakota people by saying, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. There are variations of Myrick's words, but they are all something to that effect. When settlers and traders were killed during the Sioux uprising, one of the first to be executed by the Dakota was Andrew Myrick. When Myrick's body was found, his mouth was stuffed with grass. <laughs> I am inclined to call this act by the Dakota warriors a poem. There's irony in their poem. There was no text. 
real poems do not really require words. I have italicized the previous sentence to indicate inner dialogue, a revealing moment. But on second thought, the words, let them eat grass, click the gears of the poem into place. So we could say, we could also say, language and word choice are crucial to the poem's work. Things are circling back again. Sometimes, when in a circle, if I wish to exit, I must leap. And let the body swing. from the platform out to the grasses. Thank you. We'll be back.